This morning's reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 27. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell. That great was the fall of it. This is the word of the Lord. We are uh, near the end of our series, uh, we're at the end of our series on looking at times when uh, people have called out God's name uh, twice. God has called people's name out twice, or people called out God's name twice. And this one's a little bit different um, because no one's actually said, Lord, Lord, in this particular passage. Jesus is saying, what happens if someone were to say, Lord, Lord? So it's a little different, but it's an important one. Uh, that we need to discuss and look at, and it sums up all of the, uh, the passages very well we're looking at. Uh, in a movie series I'm, I'm very fond of, a sci-fi movie series, uh, there was a, a wise leader of a group who was talking about the evil guys they were trying to fight, and he says this famous phrase, who is more the fool, the fool or the one who follows the fool? Uh, I saw another quote recently said, a fool is someone who doesn't learn from their mistakes. A smart man or woman is someone who learns from their mistakes. A wise person is one who learns from the mistake of others. Uh, And so the question we're going to be looking at today is what is foolishness and what is wisdom according to this passage today? Uh, Sharing a life from my uh, moment from my own self, I can definitely uh, relate with uh, who is more the fool, the fool or the one who follows the fool. Um, I can remember a time when uh, I was, you guys remember, uh, some of you don't, uh, there's a store called Blockbusters where you would go rent movies. And uh, I've shared this story in different places, so you might have heard me share it, but it was definitely a moment where I'm like afterwards thinking, what did I do? I was, we were checking out the movies and my, it was with a group of friends and uh, friends were walking out and one of my friends just says, hey, grab that movie right there. And unthinkingly, I just grab the movie and we walk out. And as soon as we get outside, they start running into the car and I'm like, okay, why are we running? And the guy goes, and the guy, my friend turns and says, gotcha, Chris, that wasn't our movie. That was the people behind us. And he saw these people looking at us from the window being like, did you just take our movie and run away? And they made me walk back into the blockbuster and apologize to the manager. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm a fool. Um, and gave them back the video. And my friends were laughing at the whole time at me just blindly listening to them uh, do this. It was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life and taught me to trust no one. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, Uh, But we're going to talk about that today is what is foolishness and what is wisdom. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this moment to hear your word. And so now we ask that you would send the Holy Spirit uh, to do a mighty work, um, to raise the dead, uh, to bring life where there is uh, death, to bring light where there is darkness. We pray for all the kids in our church, all the covenant children. Lord, whatever age they're at, Lord, that they would never know a moment without you as their Savior. Holy Spirit, this is a work that only you can do. We pray for any adult children who have wandered away. We ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to draw them back. And we pray now for this moment that through your word, uh, we would die to sin, become more alive to you. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this passage, if you have your own Bible, sometimes uh, subheadings uh, can be helpful, sometimes not. In this particular instance, I think it would be better if you viewed uh, much of this passage as one uh, continuous thought and not break it up as much as uh, 
some Bibles like to do, but it's okay. They're just trying to help break it apart. But uh, we're getting kind of one message here, and this is where Jesus is, is trying to deliver some warnings. And, and we think of Jesus definitely in a way of he is uh, the God of encouragement, of love, of, it says positive things. But here, he's definitely delivering a very serious, harsh message. When Jesus decides to be harsh, uh, warning, uh, when he decides to let us know the threat that is impending doom, he can be very creative. He can use words that are very clear. And here is a part where Jesus is saying something that is very important to him. And he wants to make sure that we don't miss it. So we're actually, we're going to start with verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Lord, Lord, this double word thing, have you seen is a, is, is a, when you use the double name thing, hopefully you've seen that, that it's, there's a slight intimacy involved in it. And this should be a scary passage because we have something in uh, Christianity that talks about, uh, we say it this way, that once saved, always saved. If, if the Holy Spirit has claimed your heart. If you are God's, you can't rip it away. No one can rip it away because there's passages that say you're in God's hand. He can't let it go. But we have this passage, which should send some little shivers down your theological, spiritual spine just a little bit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying this. Not everyone says, Lord, Lord. He's saying not everyone who says this emotional phrase, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So what is, what, where is this coming from? We know on one hand, you can't get out of his hand. So what is this talking about? And that's why I'm saying Jesus when he wants to give a warning, it's very uh, visceral. It's very real, right? The, the, the assumption here is someone saying, Lord, Lord, and God saying, no, that phrase didn't work. And so the question would be, well, what does work? How does this happen? There is a, a famous preacher by the name of Jonathan Edwards in the 1700s, uh, leader of Great Awakening. He was used, his sermons, he was spearheaded, uh, him and a couple other people, this a massive movement where scores of people came to faith. Uh, there was a church um, in New England that had missed out on the first Great Awakening. Uh, and the people in that church uh, believed they were okay. But the pastor there was saying, well, you know, I feel like it's, it's not happening in their hearts. So he invited Jonathan Edwards to come give a message. And he must have given him advice saying, hey, I need you to they need to know that just coming here uh, on a Sunday doesn't mean anything. They, they need to know Christ. And so Jonathan Edwards wrote a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, to put it mildly, uh, they were shaken to their core. He gave a message on how God's wrath is coming. And what happens when that wrath arrives and you don't have the grace of Jesus Christ covering you? And apparently people were shouting and, and, and moaning during the sermon at how, how scared, how much, how intense it was. And it says afterwards, when people came to faith, it was like this massive pressure being released. But 7, 21 to 23, as we'll see in a second, uh, the, the first part of this chunk that we looked at, it starts off by saying, beware of false prophets. This one doesn't quite have the title, but if it were to have a title, it would be beware of false discipleship, beware of false belief. And this is what Jesus is rallying against, saying, listen, false belief gets you nowhere. Saying, Lord, Lord, if it's not a genuine profession of faith, gets you nowhere. And you need to be well aware of the fact that just simply saying a phrase or praying a prayer is just as effective of saying you thought about going to the doctor but didn't go. He is saying, beware that you don't fall into this category. Proverbs 14, 12. 
There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Our hearts, because of sin, are corrupt, and our hearts always want to move towards things that are corrupt. Sin in us leads us to want more sin. And what happens is we let our hearts decide what we want. And this whole passage that we're looking at is Jesus is saying, listen, you need to make sure what it is you really want. Just saying, Lord, Lord, does not mean you want the Savior. Just saying, Lord, Lord, even if it's emotional, is nothing more than an emotional phrase. Lord, Lord, doesn't save you. What saves us is Jesus Christ on the cross. Nothing else saves us except Jesus. Do you got that? That's the first and most important part. Nothing saves us except Jesus Christ. You didn't save yourself. If you look, and I mentioned this on Easter, if your reason for going to heaven is because you said a prayer, you believed it really, really hard, then you're in trouble. Because for many people, as they go through different stages in life, they'll say, well, I didn't really feel it back then, or I didn't really mean it back then. And that's in saying that must mean that event never actually happened. And so far, I'm going to just reject my faith in complete totality. That's what happened. It starts to erode. Many people start to look back and, and doubt that. They put their faith in the fact that they said a prayer. And as they move through life and difficulties, for some people, their faith strengthens. From people, it weakens. And for the people who are weakening, they look back and, and the veracity of that Lord, Lord at that time becomes weaker and weaker and they doubt it. And they begin to say, you know what? Maybe I didn't really mean it. In which case, I... I'm not a Christian. I don't believe I'm done with God. If your faith is in what you cried out, then you're in trouble. But if your faith is in Jesus Christ, you're on solid ground. Only Christ saves us, not you. So what is your faith built upon? That's the first question we got to ask. False faith, beware of false faith. False faith will always point to itself. False faith sounds like this, I did. True faith sounds like this, he did. Why are you saved? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. If your answer is why are you saved because I prayed a prayer, I would say be careful. This passage has a warning for us who put our faith in anything other in Jesus than Jesus Christ. False faith says I did. True faith says he did. So how do we keep from doing this? What is the warning here? How do we keep from being the people who do that, of, of leaning that direction? We don't want to be the people who say, Lord, Lord, and realize it was never genuine or never real. So how do we avoid that? What is, what is it we're looking for? What is the true message here? Because again, we know it's not about, faith isn't about doing. So it's, it's still about belief and, and passion and the heart. What is, what's going on here? Well, the, to get there, what we want to do now, jump to the first passage, looking at false pro prophets, what Jesus says about understanding false prophets. So look at verses 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Now, just so you know, I'm saying that false prophets are to us the same thing that we are to ourselves. I would say beware of yourselves when it comes to faith. And this verse is saying beware of false prophets. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are figs gathered from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. This is the passage right before the one we just read. So to understand what he's saying about beware, so just say, Lord, Lord, let's look at what he says about false prophets. What he says is first, recognize a false prophet. They sound and look like you, but they're really wolves. And their aim is to destroy you at the end. Again, what he's saying is that they may sound theologically strong. They may sound spiritual. They even may do spiritual things, the passage says. He says, but in reality, they are not. They're just leading you off a cliff. 
And again, why is that the problem? Again, we, it is our sinful hearts that open up the doors to false prophets. And Scripture talks a lot about false prophets, and it's basically anyone who's trying to lead you away from God using God's Word, using spiritual lingo, using things. It's enticing you with your own faith to lead you away from faith. So almost anything could become a false prophet. But what gives the false prophet power, according to the way I read this, is that us, we are the ones. We are responsible now, the false prophet will be, they have to give account to God for what they've done, but we too have to be aware because we're being warned about false prophets. Remember, the fool doesn't learn. The smart person learns from his mistakes. The wise person learns from others' mistakes. Jesus is saying, don't, don't make this mistake. Learn from other people's mistakes. There are false prophets out there. Uh, so prophet is someone who speaks, tries to speak on behalf of God. A prophet is spelled with an F, not a PH, is making money, right? Uh, it's been in the news a lot recently. Uh, the former CEO of a, a, a company called Theranos uh, was manipulating people uh, into thinking that their diagnostic uh, tool using just a little drop of blood could dis dis discern all this information really quickly. And as this was happening, there were tons of experts saying Nothing, none of this makes sense. None of this makes sense. That blood doesn't work that way. The machines don't work that way. There's all these people saying, I don't see, I, I don't see. And, and on the inside, the CEO was saying, no, no, all of our internal stuff, we can't let you know about it. We don't want to let anybody know about it, but it works. And you had all these people on the outside saying, it doesn't make sense. It shouldn't, it can't work. And you had these investors pumping in billions of dollars on the word of this person, ignoring Everyone else saying this doesn't make sense. And as you all know, the news eventually, it came around full circle and it found out she was frauding everybody. Her and a group of people were frauding everyone. Billions of dollars and hope was put into this and it turned out to be a fraud. I know nothing about that industry, but there was enough concern out of other voices that I've said, yeah, that makes sense. We probably want to look into that. But you had people who were willing to ignore all of that at the hope of these amazing prophets that might have come in. I think we are very similar. What a prophet does usually is entice us, twist God's words, twist what faith looks like, to, to, to promise us something uh, outside of what Scripture promises or in a way that Scripture doesn't promise it. And what I mean by that is that God has given us guards against false prophets. And be aware, um, it's, what he's saying is it's not really the gut test. Because prophets, false prophets, uh, people leading astray can sound authentic, can look authentic, and can even do great, wonderful spiritual things. But the warning here against false prophets is you know them by their fruit. And there's a great passage in Galatians chapter 5 that talks about the fruit. And it talks about there's two kinds of fruit. Bad fruit from sexual immorality to malice and anger and evil and lust, all these kinds of things, to the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These wonderful things, right? And, and what Jesus is saying is, listen, uh, with false prophets, at the moment, you can't tell. But as you listen to how they teach, as you listen to see what fruit comes out from their teaching, you should be able to discern, are they of God of not or not? Either their ministry produces people who look like Christ or it doesn't. People who look and sound like Christ or they don't. And that's what he wants us to look for, to, to think about. And our guards against that are scripture and theology. Scripture reveals to us who God is, and theology guards us and helps us put it together in a way to understand what we're thinking about. God has given that to us. Now, God's not going to hold you accountable if you're duped. I'm not saying that's your fault, but I'm saying you have Scripture, you have theology, and Jesus is saying you need to be able to use those two things together and look at the fruit that's coming out of these false prophets. But what I want to point out is this, and he's saying, beware of false prophets. And you know what false prophets are? People who aren't producing fruit. So what's the solution? How do we do this? We've got to become good farmers. Understand 
what good and bad fruit looks and tastes and sound like. And that's how we judge false prophets. You should be able to use theology, use scripture, and look at the fruit of the ministry that's coming out. Jesus is saying, beware of them. They're going to use, again, the sin that's already in us and draw us away. 2 Timothy 4.3 says this, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Again, I would argue that for many of us, I'm not talking about being duped by a financial planner, but they do, you know, like uh, someone like a pyramid scheme, you know, but they do prey on our desire to have money, right? Those pyramid schemes. And the same way false prophets, false teachers will prey on your desire to become more spiritual. Yet twist it. And here what we're being told is that our own hearts leading us astray. So if you want to be aware of false prophets, Pay attention to their fruit. Pay attention to your heart. So now let's jump back to us. Those who say, Lord, Lord. And he says, I did not know you. How do we make sure that is not us? The same thing. We pay attention to the fruit and pay attention to our hearts. Let's read 7, 24 to 27 now. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and the beat against the house and it fell and a great was the fall of it. The, the fruit that comes from faith, how Jesus is talking about it here, is obedience. But it's an obedience that comes from the knowledge, from a faith, from a relationship with God. And so what Jesus is doing here is something called, I would call a polemic. Polemic it means it's, a, it's like a war of words, of rhetoric against something. Jesus is giving his polemic. Now, if you read the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is very caught up in people trying to do deeds— to prove that they're saved. And I think the reason why Paul is so fired about that is Jesus is fired about the same thing. He's saying, listen, just because you passionately said something doesn't mean you found grace. It's not the veracity of your prayer, how much you meant it, that means you're saved. It all goes back to who is your faith in? Remember, he says it's just a mustard seed of faith that saves us. It's not the size of the faith. It's who your faith is in. It's not in the word, Lord, Lord. It's not in how much you meant it when you prayed it. It's always about who your faith is in. The fruit of faith is that God's commands are growing inside of our hearts. The fruit of false faith is that those are not happening. So we call this here foolishness and wisdom. We call it fruit. You could also use a different word here, different biblical word, lordship. Saying Lord, Lord doesn't mean he's Lord. He's Lord when your heart has submitted to him. Not that you're perfect. This is not a message on, Jesus isn't talking about people who are being sanctified, people who are trying to grow in the faith and still have sin and working out. He's not talking about that at all. What he's talking about now is people who think just because they said, Lord, Lord, everything is okay. And what he's saying is, listen, saying it doesn't mean anything if it's not real. Is he the Lord of your heart? Lordship, or another very common word, uses discipleship. Same words here. Does he have lordship over it? Are you a disciple of him? That means to be a follower of him. And this is a, a warning he's giving because he's saying, listen, some of you, remember, especially Jews thought they just because they didn't said the right things at the right time, everything was okay. And he's saying, listen, just because you didn't said things at the right time doesn't mean anything. It's who is your faith in that matters. And he's helping them know that it's their faith needs to be in him. And I think for many of us, we need to make sure we're hearing this message too. You are saved because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. 
and not because of anything you have done. When you cry out, Lord, Lord, what Jesus wants most isn't those words. It's that your heart has submitted to him as Lord. John 15, 8, when Jesus is describing what it means to be in a relationship connected to him, he talks about a vine and this vine growing fruit. And he's saying, you want to be connected to me and I'm going to be connected to you. And he says, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. And what that means is that you are following his commands. His commands are in your heart. To bear fruit means you're connected to God. To be connected to God means you are bearing fruit. We need to put less emphasis on the prayer we prayed and more emphasis on the God to whom we prayed. Our faith needs to be in him. So go back to the beginning. How do we avoid becoming foolishness? How do we avoid becoming fools? How do we become wise? Then we need to keep, we need to guard the gospel, the message of Christ at the center of our faith. We need to learn to put less emphasis on what we have done and more emphasis on who he is. Think about it this way. What we want to do is understand that the greatest deed in our life, the greatest moment in our life, isn't when we prayed, Lord, Lord. It's the moment that Jesus cried out, it is finished. That should be the greatest moment. That's the moment he sealed the deal and saved us. We have to put our faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus is warning us that to make sure your faith is not just lip service. Because lip service doesn't save you. Only true faith does. And Jesus is saying, make sure your faith is genuine and not just lip service. And we are to keep that at the heart of our faith. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says it best, in my opinion. It's, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We want Christ to receive all the glory and praise for what's happened in us. So may our faith rest completely, be built upon completely what Jesus Christ has done. And may we learn what it means when we do cry, Lord, Lord, that what we are saying is, Lord, we submit to your plan and your will. Lord, Lord is an intimate phrase. And Jesus is saying, don't just throw it around. May it mean something to you when you say it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to see that our faith needs to be in you and what you have done and not us and what we have done. Lord, help us to understand that it's not the amount of faith, but it's who our faith is in. Help us to heed this warning and help us to understand what it means when we call you Lord, Lord, we are saying you are the king of our hearts. We believe you died for our sins and rose again and that you are coming back to claim us. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.